I'm going to call the study session of Shelton City Council to order on October 12, 2008. Uh, first item of business, I'd like to propose an agenda change since we have people here uh, to make some public comment that we have an open public comment period uh, for three minutes per individual. Um, do we have a motion to I make a motion that? to open the public comment for three minutes. I second it. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so agenda change. So we'll start with open public comment. Uh, Donna has cards, and I apologize for the late <laughs> notice for everybody, but if you would fill out a card uh, and, and uh, let Donna know you'd like to say something this, this afternoon. <coughs> and then fill out the card, that's fine with me. Most of you first. Council, Mr. Mayor, thank you both very much for hearing from us. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Will Johnson. I'm this year's 2018 Chamber Board President. And I'm here specifically to uh, address um, the Chamber's opinion on your what I believe is your first action item, and that is uh, increasing business license fees. Um, so to start with, we wanted to thank you. We know it's a complicated job trying to balance a city budget and we appreciate what you guys are doing. We would ask somehow that you find other ways to mitigate costs in some way, shape or form. We believe at the chamber that this would extremely negatively impact uh, our reputation as a city as far as being pro-business and biz business friendly. So that's all we wanted to ask and just ask that you kindly weigh any decisions regarding increasing license fees against the idea of being extremely pro-business and as opposed to anti-business. So thank you all very much. Thanks, Will. Mm -hmm. Council members, Mr. Mayor, uh, regarding the uh, properties underneath the Shelton Marina, I think we're, uh, right now we have a unique opportunity in allowing or protecting future access by the general public to those waterways. Um, if the parcels and rights of the right-of-ways are transferred to the Port of Shelton, which they're under a current lease, um, and then subsequently to the yacht club or another party, should the yacht or the uh, port decide to uh, eliminate the marina from its holdings, uh, there needs to be some type of language in the sales or lease documents to maintain public access to all by equal rates and fees by whoever takes over those spaces so that uh, any one party is not excluded from that access to those public areas. Uh, currently, there's about a 30% discrepancy in rate fees based on, you know, boathouses having bigger areas and so they they get charged a lot of a lot higher rates. If you have a large boat, you're charged a high or a lower rate than if you have a small boat. There's like a 30 foot minimum. So small boats, uh, small uh, human propelled craft, are basically excluded from access to those areas by the nature of the way the lease documents and the rental for the spaces read currently, and uh, it prohibits a large portion of people from having that access to the water. Uh, so it would be nice if there would be some look at that when you do a transfer, if you do a transfer of these properties so as to protect the rights of the individuals throughout the county for generations to come. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Okay. All right. That concludes public uh, testimony. So uh, we'll move on to our first business item, interim finance. Director Terry Snitzer has information about business licensing fees. Terry. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council members. Um, back in August when we had our, uh, I believe it was our first budget uh, meeting for 2019 budget, there were, we had talked about increasing the business license fees. And, it, and at that time, there, it seemed like there was a consensus to move it forward. So this is what I'm doing today um, to increase the fees, the like the renewal fees to 50 from 35 or 30 and the application 
from 35 to 50. So it'll um, increase the revenue about 33,000 for the 2019 budget. And so I was just asking for it to be in the action agenda if it was to be approved. Informational meeting, so questions for Terry, for Mike. Terry, isn't this aren't aren't, the, aren't we pretty low on our fees now? And this raising it to fifty is going to put us kind of like in the middle. It's not it was, yes, um, with all with, with all of the um, cities that do have business license, it would put us about in the middle. Right now, we're in. Um, the lower portion. Um, mm -hmm. If we go through some comparables, um, Centralia Chehalis are at 50, Yom is at 35, um, Port Orchard is at 35. So some of the comparable cities are, right. they can go that way. It seems to me that when we, we addressed this once before, um, Fifty dollars was kind of an average between in Washington State, or maybe between ten cities. I don't remember what cities they were, but Olympia probably. You know, is there Aberdeen or Hope William on that list? I have them in um, order by okay. amount. So, um, Aberdeen would do um, Olympia by Swim was at 56. Um, Birth Crest, I know we've used comparables in the past at 75. Tom Waters at 50. service to have it requested 75 days prior to it going into effect. So we're coming up against that deadline of January 1. So we have to have it um, approved by October 17th and submitted to the state in order for it to go into effect January 1. Um, just to kind of recap, on September 14th when we were looking through, or it's the follow-up from the August 31st meetings, the comps we had were Shelton New 35, Renewal 30, Lacey 25 and 25, Tumwater 50 and 20, Olympia 30 and 30, DuPont 75, 75, Polsbo 65, 65, Kelso 50, 50, Cedro Woolley 35, 35, um, Enumclaw 50, 25, Edgewood 40, 40. And if I recall, I was looking at um, comparable cities as indicated by Association of Washington Cities. Um, the one thing I do like about this is that it's a flat fee across the board, so it's not higher when you're starting your business, which is usually when you need a little more cash flow. Um, and, and would imagine would streamline some things on our end um, for the state too to have a single fee for both new and renewing business licenses. And the only other comment kind of that I'll add to that is anytime as a council we're looking at either increasing fees or taxes or anything like that, or decreasing for that matter, we need to be able to clearly articulate why the need to do this, what that is going to then equivalent on the general fund or the operational side of the house. Um, everybody knows that we're facing another potential year of budget deficit. Um, when times are great in the state of Washington, um, it would be great to be at this point looking at opportunities to decrease or to make things more friendly and more business, uh, uh, more advantageous to doing business with the city I think our crosswalk to where this is going to go is in that priority of being able to say, here's a little bit of an extra cash flow coming into the general fund to get us, you know, we're not going to recover the complete deficit and have a balanced budget, but um, it is going to be prioritized to helping us modernize our permitting processes, our business planning processes, et cetera, through updates, be it software systems, process improvement, et cetera. Um, those are those things that we, we've talked about, but um, just want to make sure that that's still in the forefront of our minds here as we move this forward. 
Mayor, I, I own two businesses, one in the city and one in the county, and I don't believe that $50 a year is too much to ask for a business license. You know, you get an inspection from the fire department, planning, um, and in the county they have what they call a change of tenant. It's not a business license, and it's like $250. <coughs> so I don't think $50 a year, a dollar fifty a day um, is too much to ask. Yeah, we're only raising it 15 bucks yeah. a year. Question for Terry or Mike. Um, where are we at in the budget process? Because obviously this was a one of the tools we're using to make up some revenue. Um, and because some numbers improved, at least last I saw, um, we know where we're at there. And kind of the secondary question is, I assume to get it done by January 1, we need to move quickly, but it can be done any time during the, during the year, correct? Yes, we'll, we'll just have that 75-day waiting period. Right. Yes. And, and where, where are we at on the 19 budget? So we're, we're very close on the revenue side, <coughs> on the estimation of revenue, and now it's putting all of the expenditures, not only the baseline, but the expenditure requests together. And we're still on target to have that, have a draft preliminary budget to the council on November the 2nd, I believe. Yeah, November the 2nd. Thanks. Okay, any other questions for Mike, Terry, or anyone else? Just because my computer is disconnected from Wi-Fi, um, <laughs> what, what is the uh, renewal, proposed new renewal fee again? 50. 50. The proposed 50. Currently, it is 30. that I'm moving to the business license system with the state, we might see an influx in the number of businesses who are actually licensed within the city because they will no longer be able to get a state business license and forego getting a city license as they should be. And is there an opportunity to make revenue perhaps in that way? Yes, but we don't know. Okay. We don't know. Yeah. And we don't have that number because yeah. it is new to us. Sure. Um, but it is anticipated to increase the number of businesses being licensed in the city. And this would be, if, if it is approved, we will put it on the um, fee schedule that we will be um, reviewing and bringing to council to approve for 2018 also. So that's. So are we agreed to move it to the action agenda for Tuesday? I'm good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm good. All right. Thanks, Terry. Thank okay. Next item is to revisit the uh, Fourth Street Vacation Public Works Director Craig Gregory will review information. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Mayor and Council Members. So we did provide you just a little bit more information. We didn't get it in the packet, but you have a handout in front of you. Uh, we did go back and look at the <coughs> about a decade ago of how we had done business with vacations in the past. And as you can see with that printout, it has been pretty consistent with no appraisal being done and no compensation uh, being collected from the city uh, for those vacations. And with working with Mike, uh, we have worked over the last week or so on actually looking at formalizing our vacation process. We've looked at a few other cities and how they actually do business. Uh, and we will be bringing forward after getting through, if we continue on with this vacation and, and get this one actually taken care of and figured out, uh, at that point we will be bringing back um, an ordinance to formalize our vacation process so that we don't have any discrepancies in the, in the future and really leave it up for interpretation like it is now. Uh, so as you can see, uh, again with that handout, we have not required any compensation in the past for any vacation. Uh, just most recently since we actually started moving forward uh, with a different way of actually doing vacations. We most recently had uh, the hospital vacation of Gobi 
and Mountain View Drive, uh, and then the vacation just before that was initiated by the city uh, for basically just alignment of Railroad Avenue. That wasn't something that was brought forward uh, by uh, the applicant or the property owner. That was strictly uh, for city benefit to realign uh, that roadway out between 10th and 11th of Railroad. Discussion. <clears throat> I, I think that it's the right thing to do. We haven't charged anybody else. We shouldn't charge them. And as soon as possibly, we should get a get something in writing. I, uh, I agree with that. I, I believe this gentleman was told that he could purchase the property for three thousand about a year ago. Is that true? Th that is not true. Oh, Th okay. That was never conveyed to the applicant never any price on that absolutely okay. not that is a decision okay. of at that time the commission now the council and that is not up to staff to set a price on what that value might be and that would have been well before uh, we ever did an appraisal which we did on this piece of property uh, that is skewed somewhat because it is uh, appraised at a standalone lot it's not necessarily appraised at dividing that up between the property owners it is really valued at uh, a standalone buildable lot so but that would have never been something that came okay. from staff uh, as, as far as setting a price let's say i think there's two things that we've consistently said since we began as a council which is we have to honor the commitments that were made before we came in and that if we're going to look at changing something sometimes that means that we're just going to have to get ourselves up to speed and then make those changes so as much as I think that moving forward, this is something that we should approach in a different way. Um, I think in fairness to the resident, I, I would be in support of moving forward at this point. No compensation? Yeah. Yeah, we need to. We, we have a terrible reputation in the city for not keeping our word on things. And we need to be able to, you know, be able to come back to him and say, you know what, uh, there, at that time, I don't know what the conversation was, but a piece of property was, what about the property that Mike Olson had? That piece was vacated, right, at no cost to him? That was an issue that we had uh, within uh, building and public works. Okay. Uh, that was a mistake made by the city. That is why we moved forward with that vacation okay. with no compensation also. I would, you know, I think that we need to move forward, uh, deal with this one, and then move forward with future uh, policy or ordinance or whatever. And we didn't include the language that we, we have found uh, with some comparable cities uh, or some cities that have really good, uh, what look like really good vacation policies. So we certainly will be bringing that back um, with an ordinance to, to pass something to actually solidify and, and, and make that uh, process more straightforward uh, so there isn't uh, any interpretation uh, that needs to go into that process. So I'll say my part, I'm strongly opposed to vacation without compensation. Uh, there is an asset value, the city owns the asset. I don't believe that it's in our best interest to start giving away or continue to give away. Um, whatever happened in the past happened in the past. Um, I totally emphasize, empathize with the property owners that the process should have been handled probably a little bit more expeditiously. <coughs> that being said, um, I'm not comfortable uh, setting a precedent that any time that there's available space in a, in a some, a resident in the city feels as if it is something that they can have um, that you know we should be giving it up. Um, I believe that there is uh, there is monetary value to to this asset if they're willing to pay at the assessed value. I'm comfortable with the vacation at that point, but simply giving the property away, I'm in I'm in opposition of that. So. 2007 uh, vacation, no compensation. 2008. I have a sheet here. Yeah. No, I'm reading it for yeah. for the people. That sure. Um, all, uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine compensation since 2007. I'm sorry, on um, vacations with no compensation. Why should we change it now before we put a policy in place? I say we give them the property between the four property owners and write a great policy. Three property. Three property. Three property. Three property. Three property. Greg, is, is there any other vacations applied for, known about, as far as someone? Not that I know of at this point. There's no official application. No, not, not that okay. I'm aware of. 
And the other comment I made, and I know I sent some information to Mike, is, is I question, one, the appraisal on this one specifically, and appraising any vacation of a public right of way that adjoins property. I, it's going to be very difficult, you know, it's really, well, not easy. Appraisal won't say it's easy, but, you know, vacant lots on places, it's pretty easy to find comparables or what you think are comparables. There is really no comparables to a vacation of public property next to an existing lot. So I, so I think we need to be really careful on the policy, not just to say appraised value, because that, that opens up appraised value for five, you know, a half acre based on no constraints or a half acre based on there's really only limited things the city can do with that property. So I fully agree with you, and we worked through that process with the appraiser. Uh, the one appraiser that we did find that was willing to take this uh, job on would not have taken it on if it were a split lot going between abutting property owners. Uh, that process is, is, is quite extensive and very, very costly. The estimate that he gave us uh, made it virtually impossible for us to do. Uh, and that is why we went ahead with an appraisal of basically a standalone buildable one lot uh, as far as value goes. Now that doesn't mean that, that, that certainly that pre piece of property doesn't have value, um, maybe just not to the extent of what that appraisal actually shows. But that process is very, very expensive when you start trying to cut up a piece of property or right away to give to abutting property owners from what I understand, I talked to three different appraisers and, and only one of them was willing to take the job on and it was under one circumstances that it was valued as one lot. Um, but some of the estimates that we got were upwards, upwards of about $10,000 for this individual piece of property. Um, so very, very costly. Well, this is something I think that moving forward we need to look at as well is the cost outside of, you know, here, we paid six hundred dollars for the appraisal, and the application fee was six hundred dollars. So the city is not at this point even recuperating its t staff time and the processing time for this particular um, item. And so for me, I, I think that's where we kind of get into looking forward at the fee schedules, making sure that we are able to provide services. And certainly, we're not here to to make money, but we are here to be able to ensure that that service is provided and right now we're at a wash and if we're looking at on top of that vacating the property um, I just think that we're in a bit of a sticky wicket right now because of the timing and, and past precedent I do agree with Joe that there's value to the property and that's not something that I would like us to be in the habit of doing um, however I feel strongly based on the conversations that, that we've had up until this point with the homeowner that there's a, there's a level of making things right and getting a fresh slate but I would hope that we could very quickly move forward from that to put some good policy in place to protect the city and the city's interest moving forward from here. And we have since increased the vacation fee. Uh, it did go through in the last uh, fee schedule. I believe now, I'm guessing, but I, I believe it was $2,000 now. Uh, this was under the old fee schedule that right. they paid, but I think, it, I think it's 2000 now. So we did look at that and understood that we weren't even breaking even, so we did bring that back and it was increased. So. So, so, go ahead. Uh, oh, so, am I am I clear to understand that the the potential homeowners did pay the six hundred? The city didn't pay that. They they paid that. They paid an application fee. An application six hundred dollars. It's supposed to cover staff time. But we, we know uh, it and, doesn't. And the process. Right. But the city paid the six hundred dollar appraisal fee. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, <laughs> I as a business person don't like to give everything away mm -hmm. but I think I said in our last meeting um, you know if the property isn't worth much of anything let's give it to them if it's worth if if half the lot is buildable let's charge them half but I thought about it since then and I've talked to some people and this has been going on for a year correct or so that's correct right. almost right out of here and I agree with Joe a little bit too on this because it is worth something. But this has been going on for so long that I feel like we should just give them the vacate the property, give them the property, and come up with an ordinance 
for the future so we can handle this better. That's how I feel about it. It's just get it done. But we need to we need to change our ways of thinking about this, and uh, we just can't keep giving away property. And and, and you know, Shelton being the good old boys club, you know. Um, that's how I feel about it. Yeah. I'll just make a comment. Some some of these right away vacations. I don't know these particulars, but um, I know of some that the value the values of the city. It was city property, but the value was zero. I mean, no one can do anything on that property. No. So if it, it, if it goes into the tax base, someone's going to pay a little bit more taxes on it. This this is an exception, and I'm not sure it's an exception because if, if that lot was split between or split three ways between the all the owners, which is legally what has to be done, I'm not sure what value each of those sub parcels have. That's, but in this case, that's a moot point because I agree with everybody else. This is it was done, we need to move ahead, and uh, I think we have to follow through with at least what was perceived, and I think partially led on by the city as far as um, probably not 24,000, but maybe something short of that, but I think we just need to move forward um, and place on the action agenda for Tuesday, and then setting value would be happening in the executive session, correct? Okay. So with that understanding, is everyone on board at least moving this forward to the action agenda for Tuesday? Yes. Yes. Okay. Any other, did I cut off anybody's additional comments or? Okay, thanks Craig. You're welcome. Okay. Okay, next, another property. Uh, I'm from Craig, a property on 204 Burke Street. I guess I, I don't have any additional information, so I guess just to recap, this is a property that we have had many issues with in the past. Uh, we haven't had any in the, in the most recent past, uh, but we have had uh, very close calls over the last couple of years and continuing to get worse uh, as far as flooding in that area goes. But uh, I don't have any additional information. We provided you uh, a market analysis uh, that is uh, about a year old uh, for the value of the property, but, but really it's an overall decision of with this property be, being to a point now where it, it is coming up for sale or will be on the market, uh, is this something that the city would like to purchase as a storm asset and, and make some sort of improvements to that uh, with removal of the structure and opening it up into more of an open, usable space, uh, also accounting for uh, maybe some, some widening of the creek channel uh, and, and retention for stormwater. Thanks, Greg. Well, Discussion. you know how I feel. I would be very much excited to have that done. I have another possible or another little park in the city. Um, would be an an improvement to that neighborhood. So, I like the idea. I think that, uh, you know, that house is uh, definitely rentable. Um, and, you know, if we don't do something about it, somebody will buy it and rent it out, and they will make a good little margin there, and we're still stuck with taking care of the creek, yeah. sounds like. so. I think, uh, I don't know about the market analysis, it sounds a little high to me, but you know, I, I'm, I, I've been out of the game for quite a while, but I, it doesn't come out, it comes out of the uh, stormwater fund, so it won't hurt the general fund, correct? Right. And the stormwater fund is fairly healthy at this point. So um. I would say, uh, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm for it, I would offer, I would offer a lot less since we're going to have to been probably ten or twelve thousand dollars to tear it down. I don't know what demolishing is anymore, getting rid of it, but that's uh, about, that's about what we've seen as far as doing this with city staff. Uh, can we do it in house? Yes, we certainly could. We could have an excavator that big enough, and or we rent one, or something? we we would rent one and, yeah. and do it with city staff. Yes. Okay, so we could do it. Absolutely. All right. 
Well, and I'd say that that's a market, how I feel about it. A market analysis from 2017, if anything, is probably a little low. The way that the real estate market probably been, is. Uh, yeah. And this, honestly, this it, the value of the property probably has gone up was, since that yeah. time, and so. Yeah. Um, that is something to take into account, but I think having an additional green space and if we can also alleviate an ongoing issue within um, yeah. our, our storm water, that seems like um, worth look, taking a look at, at least having that conversation and seeing if we can get to a price that um, it's a fair value. Greg, what's yeah. your cost each year? Do you have an idea what the cost each year to protect that when it starts to flood? Most recently, it hasn't yeah. been a lot. Okay. I mean, it's been, it's been fairly minimal uh, uh -huh. back in before we put the Canyon Creek bypass in we were spending likely tens of thousands of dollars every year down there uh, babysitting that creek yeah. uh, during flood uh, activities but most recently it ha it's been fairly minimal since the down or the Canyon Creek bypass went in um, so it's it's really tough to answer that, and really what that would look like in the future is is very tough to answer. Also, is there a possibility once it's demolished to have? I know there's some probably some really cool things in that house that that are old that some collector or a person would like to come in. And is there a possibility of opening that up to the public to come in and? Or is that dangerous? That, that would be something that your risk manager is going to have to think about, whether we are going to let uh, individuals into a house that we now own. Yeah. Uh, so okay. we'll, we'll have to do some, right. put some thought into Someone that. Someone mentioned that to me a couple of weeks ago. Sure. But there may be an opportunity to work with um, a, a local contractor who specializes in removing the okay. valuable pieces from yeah. the home prior to. I think that's important. Um, and, and that's something that perhaps can be looked at. We did do that. I will tell you, we did, did do that with the house that's on Northcliffe, right by the headwaters of mm -hmm. the uh, Canyon Creek Bypass. We had a contractor come in. They salvaged uh, a lot of the windows and some other things within that within that structure. So yeah. that might be something that we can sign a contract with. I do have to uh, just caution against the, the thought that this is going to alleviate all of our concerns down in that area it, it yeah. is still a pipe it is still a creek that goes back into a pipe underneath the roadway yeah. so adding some storage is certainly going to help but this i don't want this to get a decade down the road and, and feel like this was supposed to have fixed all of our problems right. this is not going to fix our storm issues down in that it certainly will help is there other houses well, i'm excuse me Okay. Is there other houses that we're helping? Because there's a lot of creeks that run through town, especially over there behind what is that? Behind Mickey's Deli in that area. No, uh, nothing that we that have has, to sandbag also. Nothing that we've had to uh, that we've had issues with like this one, and nothing that has a creek running and over directly by underneath School, it. <laughs> over by Evergreen, I know that when I was stomping around a little kid, there was creeks over there too. If we keep those uh, creeks open, uh, the only time those really have any issues is when the pipe actually plugs up, but we don't have an overall capacity issue okay, so as far as those. This is one of the main, our main concerns. That's correct. Do we have any idea how much capacity we could gain in stormwater retention on that site? It, park. Really, to be honest with you, council member, it would be a it would really be a design whether it was more of a retention pond type thing, mm -hmm. or if we were to flatten the grades out and really slope that bank back to gain capacity. Uh, I think we'd have to have somebody take a quick look at it before we did anything with it to see what that actually what gains us the most uh, capacity down there. Great, Mike. Uh, go ahead, Joe. Go ahead, Mayor. Uh, follow up on that. Yeah, rough idea what that would cost. You know, just strictly get it to a storm water retention to remove the house and get it to that point. Well, you've you've estimated what it would cost to tear down the house. So, so add, add water storm water retention. It would be basic. minimal. It would be very minimal. Okay. Yeah. Because it could be done. Dirt, is it that because most of the dirt work is done during the the tear down? Correct. You okay. do most of that. Uh, we'd have to get. We'd have to go through the tribe and and and. Department of Fisheries to get authorization to do that work, um, but really at that point it, it would be with city crews it would be a minimal effort to, to whatever that fix would be or or increase in capacity would be it, it wouldn't be much it's okay. some dirt work and and some restoration but other than that it's not much. 
Councilmember Schmidt. Yeah, I'm absolutely supportive of the, the purchase of the house from a risk management perspective. Um, that being said, I think it's absolutely necessary to look at it like an actual design of whatever you're going to do with yeah. the best management practice with the stormwater. Um, again, fixing something mid network um, may create either more or zero issues down the road and with you know fish passage and all the other things going on um, we just want to make sure we're continuing to be good stewards of, of our runoff as much absolutely as possible, so and the Squax and island tribe will make sure absolutely that we do that. they will so <laughs> and we have a great um, relationship with them we, we certainly yeah, will continue to work with them of whatever uh, that would be yeah certainly thanks yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah I am also uh, in agreement that we need to take a look at this and and realistically see what we can offer for that house I think for the long term um, just because it may be a little bit of money each year but if something more happens it could be a lot more and if that house was sold to somebody that expected a decent house the city has some obligation to so I mean it's it is definitely something I think we should look at so Mike said enough direction ahead of our meeting on Tuesday well the question is do you want it on the action agenda and what that action would be to direct staff to proceed negotiating on the sale and on the action agenda negotiating. And negotiating. Yes. Yep. And then discussing in the the executive session of what that yeah, price point that or maximum exactly would be. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Greg. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, next uh, community development. Director Mark Ziegler is going to review information about property at the Shelton Marina. Don't bump it, Mark. It took a long time. <laughs> <Did it>? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll still get a map up for your. Uh... Drawing yourself there, Mark? No, sir. No. Um, I apologize. Oh, anywhere in the gray, it should take the knee highlight away. A little smaller than I anticipated, but again, um, this is a this is a map of the um, of the marina, inner harbor and outer harbor area um, that uh, the council requested. Um, at the last meeting, um, October 2nd. Uh, the Port of Shelton has um, and is going through the process of, of uh, declaring the um, usefulness of the marina and determining usefulness of the marina and potentially surplus of that. The city uh, deeded what was indeed 17 lots but has not been confirmed. Only 12 lots have been confirmed that were of ownership in 1950 uh, to the port uh, for port uses uh, only. If the port sells or continues to exist, uh, those 17 lots, which may be 12, uh, would revert <laughs> back to the city of Shelton. Is that the ones in red in our packet? The, the ones in red are the 12, yes. Okay. The second map is just those 12 lots okay. uh, in red that's in your package. This, this is a map that shows, shows ownership amongst uh, DNR, the port, uh, city leases as well, um, as well as the right-of-ways uh, that are encompassed within the marina property. That's kind of a separate issue that, um, that I'll touch on as well. So what the Port of Shelton has asked is that um, if the city did not have interest in, in uh, these lots, if they can enter, the city would enter into an agreement with the port to waive the reversion uh, so they could continue uh, with a kind of a marina, if you will, as, as a whole um, for any options that might come down the road, including surplus and sale. Um, so as I indicated previously, I, I believe there's three options, essentially, and that is waiving the reversion <coughs> clause, at this point, allowing the port to, 
take those parcels on and include them as a package in the entire marina with the rest of the parcels. Um, doing the same, but uh, adding some language that would require uh, public access to be ma maintained in some sort, whether it's what is existing now or at your, uh, at your discretion. Um, and the other is just um, not a way to take, take those, those parcels on and decide what you want to do with them at that point. There's obviously a lot of decisions based on that decision uh, that will come down the road beyond just the reversion. So do you, do you lease them back to whoever might be the owner? Um, do you sell them? Uh, we have the same things we've been talking about now with, with the right-of-way issue, with appraisals and costs associated with, um, with uh, managing that transaction, any risk management that comes along with uh, the improvements or, or what might not be improved that is uh, within those tight lands. So there's some decisions to be made if that's, uh, that's the direction that the council might to proceed. Okay, thanks, Mark. Open for discussion. So we waive the, re the, the reversion clause, deed the property back to the port, and we want public access. What, I mean, what does that look like if they sell that property to one, one person, developer, or somebody wants a yacht club again? They want a restaurant. I mean, yeah. so, Every indication uh, that we received is there's not much interest from the port. They've obviously done a public process, but the word is out there's not much interest. There may be inter interest as we've had through public comment to today uh, that, the, uh, that the Yacht Club has some interest in that, in that as well, and that uh, there be, could, they could provide the, and maintain the public access that's there now. The public access that is there now is within a right of way. So it's in the Spruce Street right away. Oh, right here, right in the middle. So that's Spruce Street, and that's the city right away. And this is the visitor stop right in the middle. So that's the public access that's in place now that is within a city right away that is leased to the port. That lease is up in 2025. So the city has the ability to, as well as the uh, responsibility um, for RCW to maintain public access and not vacate those rights of ways if they put the body of water or they're within the body of water that, to promote and, uh, and provide public access for their community. So there certainly is that opportunity within those right of ways, um, at, especially with Fruit Street <coughs> right there, that already has that public dock to maintain that through an extended lease. Did you say, now, who, is, who has not much interest in this, did you say? You said there's not much interest. From a developer or Anybody. something? Okay. Councilmember Browns. Raise your hands, please. Councilmember Browns. Um, well, you brought up a name and something. I've been kind of pondering this thing of this for the past week quite a bit, and, uh, and I hadn't really thought about it, but I do think that um, Somebody that would be greatly interested in whichever way this goes would be the Shelton Yacht Club. And so they are separate from the port. And I guess, what is their opinion or idea? Because I would think the future of that marina, I mean, they would have a, they would be a big stakeholder in this. So you understand? Seems to be an identity here that we, we, we I think we need to investigate or find out you know, what they're thinking too about that. The, there's genuine interest, obviously. They've got their stakeholders there. They are, they are uh, tenants of, of, of the port of the marina at this point. Uh, so there certainly is interest. I think it certainly has to fall into place as well. Um, I think a divided property with separate ownerships complicates the matter with anybody that might look at purchasing or taking ownership of Laurel Street is also at the top there, and that's a Correct. maintained city right of way. Correct, right here. So you have Laurel Street, the city right of way. You have an alley, the okay, alley, city right of way. You have Spruce, which is here, and then Pine Street, which is down at the bottom. And those are all city right of ways. Mark, do you know of any other uh, private marinas that have, due to being on state or city, public access requirements to the, another landowner having some? I haven't researched that. Okay. And currently we don't manage 
manage or maintain any other marinas in the cities. So this would be some a new thing uh, for the city to have to take on, correct? Correct. So I'm supportive of uh, <coughs> relinquishing this back to the port um, along as, as long as we maintain the public aspect, public access aspect of this. Um, I just don't believe we're ready to be getting into the marina or waterfront management business at this point at the city. But um, plus, with what we would have access to technically, it would be probably more more of a challenge to get our arms around that. Than these are just docks on the water, correct? They're, we don't own dirt there. These are tie decks. So tie decks. These are yeah. so this is this is the shoreline, yeah. essentially here, and these are three lots the city has. So there's one that abuts the shoreline. It's 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 State Route Three is right there. It's heavily banked. It's quite the grade there. Um, and then there's these parcels. And these these are the least parcels that I'm that I'm referring to. And then there's these, I believe there's four right here on the bottom. So you'll see the tide lines up here. So there's some separation here and here between uplands and the tide line lots of the city is leasing at this point. Are there, is there ever a time that those lots are not submerged? Uh, potentially uh, lot eight here, <laughs> potentially um, mud flat. Okay. And yeah, that's probably the only one that has potential not to be, um, uh, yeah, be impacted by tides. Eric, would this release from any liability there could be down there, contamination in the waters or anything like that? Again, uh, that'd be a that'd be a legal question. Um, I, I think that um, since it's at least from 1950. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there certainly could be, but I think that we would ask a legal opinion of uh, what, uh, what the city's implications are with, uh, with uh, foregoing those. That's right across the street from where the big oil tankers were, isn't it? Uh, pretty close, yeah. yeah. Um, Cole's, uh, Cole's tanks across the highway, yeah, we're just, just a bit kind of less than that, yeah. Me, I'm raising my hand here. Oh, um, so the, there's, they were talking about the up, up or re, redoing the dock, one of the docks down there, for over a million dollars, right? Actually, two point eight. So this southern dock, the estimate estimated replacement of this dock is two point eight million. Uh, the the bulkhead repair and replacement is about a million dollars in this area. So that's a good reason why. Um, there is some indication that the, the, the court doesn't have their last appraisal back yet. There is some indication that, that, that the appraisal um, will be less than the liability on, on the property. Okay. okay. All right. And we don't maintain that boat launch, right? We don't. That's that's under lease with the port. The port does it, or the state does it, or no? The, the port of Shelton is this Pine Street right away here yeah. is is part of the lease agreement. Of all four of these right aways with the Port of Shelton. So going back to what Joe said, so we're pretty much in agreement on option three, number three. Yeah. Okay, so that's I think that's it. Yeah. And for staff clarification, that 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 requirement for public access could mean the existing public access that is there now, no no yeah. greater, no less. Right. Yeah. For these purposes. Yeah, I would invent something new for that. I would say that'd be the minimum. Yeah, minimum. minimum. Okay. Potentially. Okay. So no less. No less. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So just if I could just, if I, I would really feel we need, I, I wouldn't mind having an opinion from the Yacht Club <laughs> on how they feel about all this stuff because it seems like they're, that's their primary place and that you've got the port you're dealing with. And then you have the city, you know, and, and you know, it's a port that we legally deal with. But the Yacht Club, I would think, I wouldn't mind having a real statement because if the port sold that marina to an outside buyer, what would that relationship with the Shelton Yacht Club be? Could they excommunicate the Shelton Yacht Club? 
I mean, that's the, and maybe this is not something that we need to think about, but I do, uh, I wouldn't mind hearing from the Shelton Yacht Club about what their, what their feelings are about. Uh, our, our, our shoreline master program requires a recreational aspect. Um, I think that that is the, the largest tenant you're gonna have at Oakland Bay Marina, it, our, our recreational orders. There's, there's a certain aspect of uh, commercial um, use but uh, right now they're maxed out at 10 fluxies down there, mm -hmm. uh, and they can't increase that. So I think if, if the example of a private developer owner wanted to come in, um, they'd have to go through the shoreline management <coughs> program, uh, and as well as they would have to find tenants for all of those slips and all of that area when they've got a market right now. That yacht club is, is the market. Those boat owners are the market that are utilizing that, those slips and that marina and paying that rent every and realistically, unless the city put in some type of requirement on the transfer of the deeds, it's, it's basically a, a transaction between the port and yeah. whoever. For, for those uh, parcels. Yes, You certainly right. have the rights of ways that are still, um, you still have the ability to negotiate upon uh, the use of those, of right. those rights of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, correct. Um, that's a business transaction between the port and whoever made. Sure. Well, with the, as Gary was saying, um, uh, like Kevin. Yeah, no, no, no very, I'm just for after he's done. So if somebody I buys it, that, you know, Gary has a point. So if somebody buys it from the port, it's almost you know, guaranteed that those rates will go up for those boat owners. And that might, you might want to hear from the boat owners how they feel about that. Right? I don't think that's our business. <laughs> like between the port and, whoever, and the boat owners or whoever buys it at the boat owners. Oh, I lost my thought, but I'm, oh. sure, I'm sure I can regain it. Um, okay, so to clarify protocol here, in executive session we discuss it, whether we're going to charge the port for this property or just give it to them. Is that, we don't talk about that in this meeting, is that correct? You, so, you may discuss in executive session the minimum compensation that the council will require for the surplus of property, yes. One, one, one point of clarification, I think, because there's kind of an elephant in the room here. Um, there has been discussions with the, with the Yacht Club. We're not at liberty to, I guess, discuss that at this point, but there, we have had some discussions with the Yacht Club. They're not, they're not sitting, you know, outside the room um, <laughs> waiting for something to happen. They, they are proactive. Um, they're interested. They've had discussions with the court. We had a discussion with them earlier this week. So they're they're up to speed. They they know the process. They know what's happening in front of them. And they're uh, I think they're they're prepared for um, several scenarios. Thank you. So do you have enough from Council Mark? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. sir. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, on to item five, which is turn over to Mike McCarty, please. Great. Thank you. Uh, a series of kind of housekeeping items here this afternoon for you. I wanted to give you an update on where we are with four key unfilled positions. Uh, as you know, the city contracted with Bob Slavin, Slavin Management Consultants, to recruit and bring forward qualified applicants for the city manager position. Uh, as of October 1st, Mr. Slavin had received 21 applications, and I think many, if not most of you, have had an opportunity to go through those. In, in between time, we have received two additional applications, so if you want to uh, check that the application book out and look at those two applications, you're free to do so. In the meantime, <clears throat> Bob has sent a supplemental questionnaire to nine candidates. That questionnaire is due back on Monday afternoon. Uh, I talked to Bob this morning, and he, he felt that one of the additional two candidates would be deserving of a supplemental as well. This is one of the problems that you get into when you have a open until filled process, because a questionnaire is quite in depth. As you, as you know, if you recall the previous questionnaire, we've added some questions to it as well. Uh, so we agreed today when I talked to him to go ahead and send a supplemental to this additional candidate, but only give him a week. 
uh, to fill it out, rather than the previous candidates have two weeks. Uh, he was trying to get two weekends in there, but in the, uh, uh, the desire to continue to move this process along, we felt that was reasonable. So we'll keep you posted. Uh, it will be interesting to see the results of the supplemental questionnaire. And when those are available, I'll uh, make them available to the council as well. Thank you. So, uh, second position that I wanted to talk about. Combined position of assistant city manager and finance director. Uh, assistant city manager portion is currently unfilled. Finance director is being filled on an interim basis by Terry. Thank you very much. And uh, we're not, we have not really been successful in attracting qualified applicants for this position. Uh, there were two candidates that uh, were in the running. One is subsequently withdrawn and Based upon what we decide to do with that position, one other will likely withdraw as well. The issue that I see is that you, it, it's almost an impossible position between the duties of an assistant city manager and a finance director. And in the month now almost that I've been here, I think the focus should be on the finance director position. It, it is uh, of utmost importance to the operations of the city. It is important that we have a finance department that is fully functioning, functioning to provide the council with the reports that you need in order to move the city forward. It's important for every department to be able to trust what's happening in that finance department. And I would like to re-advertise for that position with the assistant city manager piece stripped out of it. And as I told uh, others, I think that it, it would be a very, very unusual position to fill. Uh, looking around at other cities, particularly our size, there's not very many of them, frankly, that have an assistant. And uh, there are, it's even more rare to have the assistant combined with the finance director position. So it's just a, a four-year information that that's the direction that I'm inclined to head. And certainly, if the council disagrees with that, you can let me know. So the next position is the city clerk position. And that's currently being filled by an interim city clerk. Donna has uh, stepped in quite capably uh, as an interim. There was a recruitment made. 12 applications were received. And again, to be honest with you, I have not gotten back to those yet. However, this is another one of those that technically it was a combined position with a legal process assistant. And that legal process piece was added when we had a full-time city attorney here with the contract we have with uh, Porter Foster and Rorick. I don't believe that it's necessary to have that piece of the uh, a job description combined with the city clerk. Plus, they're two big jobs, frankly. They're two big jobs. So uh, I'm inclined to go back to the 12 candidates that we have to see if they're still interested if we do strip away the legal process assistant piece and move forward with only recruiting for a city clerk. The last piece, the human resource manager, is currently unfilled. Uh, they did conduct interviews on that prior to me coming. Two candidates have subsequently withdrawn from consideration. Uh, I intend to re-recruit for that position. It's another key position that uh, that needs to be filled. So that's my report on open positions. If you have any comments or discussion on that, I'd be receptive to it. Comments for Mike? Uh, I okay. will. I will just say that I am in 100% agreement with you that the finance director is a very important piece and a good one. That's their job. So 
mm -hmm. the assistant city manager, if the city grows to a point where there's more confusion than we've had lately, that would probably be a good thing to have. But I am in agreement with those positions. Uh, the human resource person, not knowing much about that, it seems to be a very important thing amongst the people I've talked to with larger minds than mine. So I think I would agree with the suggestions that you put forward. Do you have any thoughts as to how this might affect the budget in terms of if we are, how, how this might be restructured in terms of additional legal fees being incurred by kind of changing the way that we process those things as well as um, costs involved with the recruiting or instead of having a combined assistant city manager finance just to finance, I imagine there's some fluctuation then in benefits packages, salaries, et cetera. There is, and I don't have exact numbers for you, council members. Uh, but, but I do just intuitively, you know, we've gone for several months now uh, with either interims or in the case of HR with nobody in that position. So I'm, I'm fairly confident that if we did a budget analysis on it, it would be at, at best budget neutral. Uh, rolling forward, the, the positions were budgeted for at, uh, uh, in the, the ordinance that adopted the salary schedule. So I'm confident that it won't impact the 2019 budget to have these positions filled as quickly as possible. Now, what caveat to this is that depending upon the speed at which the Slavin uh, folks move, it is possible that you could have an appointment for a city manager uh, made with a city manager here around the first of the year. So then the question is, do we want to move forward quickly in filling these positions or at least provide the new city manager with a candidate pool from which to, to make his or her own choice. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, the reality is that that's probably what the scenario will be, but I can't totally predict that at this point. Mike, one of the, I believe, for the clerk combined legal, I'm say assistant, was with the contract attorney, kind of the gatekeeper, the person who would, you know, kind of control the flow to the contract attorney and back. Mm -hmm. I think, would, would that change? Would the clerk be doing that, or would someone other on the staff be that kind of in-between person? I think that the gatekeeper, honestly, should be the city manager. Because mm -hmm. ultimately, it you know, it, it's my responsibility at this point to manage that contract and to, uh, to know what's coming down the pike with the contract attorney makes sense from that high level. Thanks. My motivation with this is to find absolutely the best city manager we possibly can at this point. And from there, if the timeline works the way it may work, I, I would agree, but let the, inter the new city manager um, recruit their uh, management team. And while I agree with that in principle, um, I will say that we have experienced here in hopes of holding off on some things until we have someone in place. Um, I think we're opening ourselves up to significant risk, and so I think that one thing we have to keep in mind is the time frame of all this moving forward, and hopefully, if all goes as it should, um, we would have those candidates available for um, the new city manager to make those choices, um, but should the city manager search fail or be prolonged, which I hope it's not is not going to fail. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure, Mike? Yeah, we're um, not fair. So if it is prolonged um, by any extent, I think we may have to reconsider how long we want to wait before appointing those positions. It, it definitely is a work in progress, and and I wish I could make it so uh, uh, specific to to uh, to dates, but it it is something that we're just gonna we'll, we'll have to be flexible with and uh, and move it forward. Fortunately, we have. Uh, very good people in those interim positions. HR is still a little concerned in my head, but, uh, but we're doing okay. Yeah. You know, there was a lady here not too long ago that did HR, and she did clerk, and she did this and she did that, and she wore a lot of hats. And I always thought she was well overworked, and then she was interim, I mean, she was city assistant manager. And 
before her, there wasn't an assistant manager. And I agree with Mike. I think we can. I always thought that the assistant city manager slash finance director was kind of a stretch. I thought, but uh, that's just how I felt about it. It was it was a little little much, especially the shape that we're in or have been in. It needs to be focused on finance. And thank you, Mike, because I, I think we all have been looking for some guidance as far as how this network we're relying heavily on staff feedback and your feedback to determine what will functionally work within the scope and structure of the city staff. Um, we recognize that that is ultimately a decision of the city manager, and, and I, for one, and I would imagine everyone else at this table is supportive of, of any moves that you would make to get us moving in the right direction. That's my goal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. So I guess there'll be some things on the action item for November 6th to, yes. uh, to address I'm, that. I just have a question for the rest of the council, uh, Mayor, is have we all reviewed the current candidate list? Have we all reviewed all the applicants? Except the two additional Other than the I two have. new ones that just came yeah. in. Right. Yes. I, I, have. I have not. I have not. I'm waiting for you to drill it down. I don't need to read 27 or 22. <laughs> Well, that's why we have slave. We'll do cliff notes. When you have slave well, and you, we'll, you get it You said there's there. nine. Did you say there's nine? Yeah. The nine, the nine that have been sent to supplemental. There's yeah. 23 there was, applications. Do you know those nine? Do you know those nine? So, uh, I mean, we wouldn't have picked all 27 or 23. I'd like you to look at all of them. Okay. All right. Okay. It'll only take six, seven hours. <laughs> <laughs> staff discussions about the fact that that would be a good idea to do with the port commission at some point in time. And so really all I wanted today was to get some direction if you feel that would be a good idea and then we can work with the county and or the port and, and with all of you in facilitating that kind of a joint meeting. Well for six years we did that after the I think was it right after the first of the year, I think we had a joint county, port, and city meeting uh, for six years in a row. I didn't think we had that last year. So mm -hmm. we I definitely need to get in sync on that, I believe. Any, any disagreement on? I think it's fantastic. Yeah. fantastic. Good idea. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll move forward and, and work with the county and the port to uh, make that happen for you. Okay. Okay. So next, and this is uh, uh, again an item of um, interest because it, it really impacts the direction from the entire council. So council member, Deputy Mayor Peterson, uh, sent an email suggesting some uh, items for possible inclusion on the future uh, council, council meeting agenda. And they're all good ideas, worthwhile discussion, but it's one of those where, as the manager, I, I, you know, I'm not just gonna take the ball and run with it because you all have to agree these are good ideas. So I really wanna turn it over to uh, Deputy Mayor Peterson for her to talk through the bullet points that are included in your briefing and just get uh, discussion about whether or not you want us to routinize these ideas in the regular council meeting. And so, thank you, Mike. This is something that, um, based on conversations we've had in previous council meetings and also in some of our staff briefings, um, I brought to Mike as, as a matter of discussion as to whether it's something that might be included in the agenda. Those items are enforcement reports. We've had continuous conversations about being proactive with code enforcement, and um, one aspect of that, I believe, is us reporting back to the public on, on what we have done on their behalf. Um, it's something that we had asked Chief Moody to begin thinking about what that might look like, but I think just having it as a regular 
agenda item, whether that's every meeting or once a month or quarterly. The frequency of any of these could be up for discussion, but that was one item I, I included here. Another is budget reports, which I know we've discussed a few times, um, so that we are being very transparent and bringing to the public on a regular basis a report as to where our finances currently are. And thank you to Terry and Sandy and the entire staff for getting us some solid numbers so that we can be in a better position to do so and report accurately as to the state of our financial health. Um, the third item being press releases, and I thought that might be something that could simply be covered during the manager's report. There's a lot of good things or items of information that I see in the paper or on Facebook that don't get discussed during our public meetings, and I thought it might just be one more opportunity to, again, bring that to light. And the last being standing um, or adjunct committee reports. So even if there's nothing to report, simply to have it on the agenda as a reminder so those items don't fall by the wayside, things like the tiny homes project or specific um, council, either new projects or committees that are standing could be reported on regularly. So that's all I had. I'm not, I'm not gonna buck either, I'm just gonna say that right now. So. <laughs> okay. I'm not gonna stand in her way. I would very much appreciate your feedback, Gary. And Debbie Mayor, as you know, this is something we've definitely talked about on and off for quite some time, but um, I think frequency uh, should be at least monthly. I don't think there's any need to be any more than that. And probably the first meeting in each month to recap last month's. Mm -hmm. Simple enough, um, I don't wanna also create um, and be overburdensome with data and stuff to staff. So um, if that is unreasonable, we're, I think, willing to hear and, and, and negotiate on that, so. Okay, any other comments? Everybody's in favor, so. Yes. That correct answer. Would that committee yeah. report be given by Mr. Mayor or Deputy Mayor? I would anticipate it would be given by the committee chair. Sure even just during their council during their council reports or during a special mm -hmm. item on the agenda. Um, but just to recap mm -hmm. where where discussions are, when the next meeting is, what the process has been to this point, I think would be helpful. And just to kind of tag onto this, because I was quite impressed with press releases. I really think it's important that the citizens, because sometimes they just drive around and they see messy streets or whatever and they can really you know, say it took me an hour to get someplace because I had to wait, but it would be really kind of nice to have a little positive, this is what the city is actively doing. And I think that goes along with code enforcement. We did this lot, we, this, we did this house. So a little bit of more, this is what we're doing, because I don't think in our commission or council meetings, forgive me, that we quite, that what we do gets out there, I, I think, enough. And so I think that is, uh, you know, not a lot of people show up to our meetings, but it is on <coughs> media. And so I think that a little more focus on, because there's a lot of really good, exciting things that the city of Sheldon has been doing and is doing and will continue to do in the midst of uh, sometimes uh, adverse conditions. But uh, I think it's important that if we don't say it, Sometimes who's going to say it? So I do think that would be a good, uh, a good thing to, uh, to do. Great. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome, Gary. Um, I think it's a great idea. I have several people saying, complaining, what's going on with the roads, and I said, well, did you read the newspaper? Well, I don't read the newspaper. Did you get onto Mason Web TV? No, I don't do that. Um, well, you know, there's information out there for you. And they, you know, they don't quite understand that. Anyway, so that's a really good, good thing to do. The media, encourage the media. Yeah. And my goal with all of these items, I think, was just to kind of um, put some structure around the conversations that we've had as a council about transparency and public involvement. And so I, I appreciate the feedback on that very yeah. much. Likewise, thank you. That was a good discussion. I, just a couple of questions, actually. Do I know of one subcommittee that was an ad hoc uh, committee on the tiny homes? Have you organized yourselves into other subcommittees? Okay. No, not really. Okay. We had kind of an unofficial early on budget committee, but no. Okay. All right. But, so we good, good, that. Good yeah. to know. All right. And 
and then just a, com a, a comment. And as you know, uh, you know Terry has sleepless nights because she <laughs> she knows about the request for budget reports, and the finance staff is working very hard to make sure that we uh, can get up to date and start delivering those reports to you on a regular basis. So, okay, thank you. Great. Well, we'll fold. Uh, I'll take direction that you'd like to see reports such as these at least monthly, and we'll fold those into the regular agenda reporting okay. process. Thank you, Mike. I'd like to oh. see, uh, ask Terry, how do you feel about that as far as uh, monthly? Is that pretty, is that doable? I think once we get the finance situated with the new finance director to where um, you know, I can move back into my position to where I can get um, entries made, um, the accounts balanced, and to get everything in t on a routine basis. Mm -hmm. It's just, we are down one staff accountant. We're down this, uh, the director. Um, I have the state auditor on site. Um, yeah. We have some corrections that need to be made. Plus you um, have an outdated system. Or we a, have a, a system, system that, that is that not work software, no that problem is, with software. So. Yeah, that is not user friendly to us. Well, I was thinking maybe quarterly, but whatever whatever we agree on, I guess. I but know. I think what's written in there is to shoot for quarterly to initially, and then hopefully move at some point to monthly. And I think and I think we'd goal. be mm -hmm. I think we'd be great with that. So and just so you know, just to give uh, council an idea, the auditor has asked us to make corrections to what she's requested by the end of the month before she leaves. So. Um, I am scheduling weekends for my staff and I to um, try and work through those so that we can meet her deadline. So, so to get Thanks, that Terry. report, that finance report to you, I, I'm not sure we can do. Now let me know when that is. I'll bring the copy and donuts. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, next, uh, pro call manual. Back to Mike, I believe. So earlier this year, June and July, you uh, received a copy of a council protocol manual. And uh, the, uh, the manual was not adopted by you. The only thing that you did subsequent to that was adopt uh, an ordinance changing the date and time of city council meetings. I think it's good business to have such a manual. Uh, I asked Kathleen Haggard, city attorney, to review the former manual, and in your package is the a copy of the original manual with the strike-up version that reflected uh, uh, notes and comments from a variety of other people. And then you have a, a clean copy, which was Kathleen's condensed version. I think she took it from 70-some pages down to 40. Uh, stripped out a lot of language that she felt was not necessary to be in the protocol manual. But she also emphasized to me that these documents um, are living documents. And she's done several of these manuals for city councils around the state. And she said there's often times when things will come up that uh, the council will decide this needs to be in our protocol manual. So I, I want you to know that even though you may ultimately adopt the protocol manual. It is a living document, and it's, it's a document that is intended to provide guidance. It's a guideline. It's not, uh, it's not law, necessarily, although it will cite law in some cases. And it's uh, uh, you know, to be taken as a guideline and not as a, as a strict course of action. So, I'm just asking for, again, some discussion and direction on this. Kathleen did state that she would be more than happy to come down, uh, whether it would be a study session or a pre-council meeting, to go through the manual with you so you understand what's, what's in it and understand how we go about implementing the provisions in the document. Uh, so if you have any if you have any thoughts or comments to give us a little bit further direction on this, I'm open to it. A quick question. You said Kathleen at one point had something that was more gleaned from other cities. Is that the 
that that option is in here, or is the option in here that she did was our original draft that she cleaned up even more? I believe both. Okay. That that she she included some some areas or some language from protocol manuals that she's done for other cities, as well as cleaning up the the document that you previously worked from. So we just like this electronic, so we can review it. This version is outside of the packet in a word document. Yeah. Okay, we can do that. Yeah. Two, two cents. Two cents on that. Just uh, if we have a new city manager within three or four months, I w I don't know. I'm, I just have kind of questions about some of this stuff. If we, you know, he may have some input on that subject. Sure. And I don't, but it's again, when are we going to do stuff? I mean, we can put stuff off for years yeah. until we get into a certain place. So I don't know if that would enter into that or if there's a lot of things we could do that would leave flexibility for the new city manager to say, hey, I would rather this to kind of go this way, right? I don't know. Well, my take on that, to be honest, is that if I were the new city manager coming in and I saw that you had already had an adopted protocol manual, I'd be like, wow. That's one thing I don't have to deal with right now. Let's do it. And you know, so, it. so I move ahead quickly. Yeah, I, I mean, I really do yeah, think I think that it's one of those fundamental, foundational pieces that should be there regardless of the timing. And and as I said a minute ago, it's a, you have to take it as a, it is a fluid document. It's not a document that's chiseled in stone. Uh, you know, so that if a new manager comes in. And he or she says, you know, I'd really like to talk to the council about adding some language here or taking some language out. That's that's the council's choice. So do you, we believe a separate study session would be in order to go through this, or just? Yeah, I'd like to read it. We got this information like late last I understand week. that, but in the future, say in the next two weeks or whatever, do we want a separate study session strictly on a protocol manual, or work it into agenda item and records? You know, I don't, I don't really have an idea uh, from Kathleen as to how long it might take to go through the manual, but I would guess you're probably looking at an hour anyway uh, to go through it in enough detail, and but also not so much that you're falling asleep. <laughs> oh. So I, I like the mayor. I like the ideas of setting some um, some action on this, some action items on this, and we're related to deliverables. So um, we want to save initial review within two weeks and then set a meeting um, and then plans to adopt by a date. Um, I, I think that'd be good and yeah. kind of hold ourselves to that. Yeah, I'd like to set a, you know, a review session, whether it's on its own or together, probably two weeks, start two to three weeks out, they'll give us a week to review it. might impact the timing a little bit. Kathleen will be here on October the 29th from 1.30 to 4.30 <coughs> to do a Public Records Act training session for all of you and for key staff, all, the, all staff, the department heads and staff that are involved in public records. Uh, and it, so I did, I, shifting gears here a little bit, but I wanted to make sure that you knew that she was going to be here. So to be honest with you, I'm thinking about being uh, efficient with her time. Absolutely. If we could tag, Good morning. tag on to oh, yeah. that, you know, either at the beginning or the end, it might not be a bad idea. Good idea. Great idea. Okay. October, when was it? 29th? October 29th, that's a Monday. And I, I prefer before, because I think that the protocol manual may take more of our yeah, we'll have to see Thank you. people do that. Yeah. So is everybody good with that? Have it all the same day? Yeah. Okay. Be a long day. We'll bring a bag lunch. And the oh. sooner we can get the dates on those things, so especially Joe and I are working through our work calendars, would be very yes, much appreciated. Yes, I understand that. So, and appreciate your but that's
that said, I understand that this is something, especially in public records, that we need to make a priority and become informed about. So thank you for providing that opportunity and, and being efficient with that time. I, I do appreciate it. Sure. So I mean, we'll, we'll check with Kathleen to see if she might be available to come down, say, at noon. Maybe McDonald's will be open, then we can have McDonald's brown bag. Huh? <laughs> what do you think, guys? You'd like it, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I would say, Tamley, put it on uh, the look forward for four weeks after that to approve it. To approve it. So moved. Okay. That's all I. That's all I have this afternoon. I I've been going through my piles and piles of things. And uh, but for the closed session to talk about labor negotiations, I'm I'm done on the admin side. Okay. It's not on the agenda, but can we just have an open discussion about briefings versus this type of? Um, study yeah. section. Yeah. Instead of briefings. Instead happens. of briefings. I much prefer this. this yeah. One. Well, okay. So if we have an issue, a personal issue, we can go and talk. You know, with Mike right away. It's just, this is really good. Any, any other input on that? Would this be once a month then? Or once every two weeks? So let, let me just interject here. In, as you read in the protocol manual, it does suggest study sessions. Mm -hmm. and But it doesn't fix a date or time. So one other thing, that, one other factor to consider, and we learned this with this Friday study session, didn't we, Don? Yes, we did. And staff, that the, uh, the problematic part is the preparation of the packets for the study session along with the Tuesday council meeting and the, the proximity of the yeah. two. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I, I'm very pleased, frankly, and you know that I've talked to you individual, individually about doing study sessions, and I think this has been a great afternoon here. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys have had good, honest uh, discussion question and answer about the issues that, uh, that we're facing. And uh, you, know, you don't have to decide this now, obviously, but I think uh, if you could work in, think about working in a study session at least once a month, and maybe another time, depending upon the issue, on the off Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. That would be very helpful for staff because it kind of fits yes. into that routine anyway. Uh, and the, you know the timing would be dependent upon your availability, and I am respectful of uh, the council members that have work obligations as well. So, well, in just my two cents, I, I think you might because I think the other piece of this that may get lost is when we get in groups of twos and threes to come in and have briefings. That takes a significant amount of, of all of your staff's time, and so if, if this yeah, is a, a better, more efficient to, way yeah. for us to have conversation and allow you some more time to do your job, which you're already so overburdened with, I think this is a, a really wonderful solution. So I appreciate right. us getting back into this habit. I think it, it seems to be working well. Once a month. Four more. So, uh, <laughs> so, so I, will, I will put this on, on my report for, the, uh, for, for an action item next Tuesday's council meeting. Okay. How do the three over there feel about it? They don't have a chair. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, I just wanted to know how they felt. I'll ask you would, later. And I would far much more lean towards putting two on the calendar and then canceling one if we don't have enough, just to make sure that we have a quorum if we need to get everyone together. Yeah. Um, it's much easier to take something off the calendar and gain back a few extra hours than try to squeeze something else in. Yeah, and our goal, and besides getting out front, is also to be fully prepared exactly. for the subjects that are coming up at the council meeting. So are we looking at one a month or one every other week? I think we're going to schedule two, two. off the off so Tuesdays. Second and four. Second and four Tuesdays to be dropped as needed. But mm -hmm. at this point, I think through budget season, I think they're going to be needed probably. Exactly. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Um, okay. So we're going to adjourn the public portion. Go into closed session. Go into closed session.